Greetings, everyone. My name is Sarah Barnes, and on behalf of Campbell & Company, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Future of the Arts, Strategies for Sustainability, the second of our 2012-2013 Campbell & Company webinar series. Before we begin today's interesting discussion with our panel, I'd like to quickly review some logistics for those of you who may be new to Campbell & Company webinars. So to ensure you have the best webinar experience possible, just uh, please follow these tips. Close any programs, other than GoToWebinars, of course, that are running on your computer. Use a call in uh, on a telephone versus using your computer speakers. You tend to have better reception that way. And move your cell phone away from your computer. And finally, if you experience any visual issues, contact GoTo at 1-800-263-6317. Today's webinar will last 60 minutes, and you will earn one continuing education credit for your participation, and that's good for certification with CFRE International. About an hour after the webinar, you will receive an email from GoToWebinars that includes a web address to download your certificate, the PDF of the presentation, as well as a code to receive a complimentary registration for our next webinar. If you have a question during the presentation, and we would love to have this be as interactive as possible, please send a chat to Campbell and & Company. And now I'd like to take a moment to introduce Robert Alpa. Robert Alpa is a senior consultant with Campbell and & Company, and in addition to having held high-level positions at arts organizations across America, such as Joffrey Ballet, Arizona Theater Company, and Williamstown Theater Festival, he has helped a number of arts institu institutions increase their fundraising capacity. Robert has partnered with the Guthrie Theater, Milwaukee Public Museum, Victory Gardens Theater, and the Cole Center for Dance and the Performing Arts in the Twin Cities, among others. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Robert. Robert? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, very uh, compelling topic uh, for today, uh, talking about sustainability and stability in the arts. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I, I would like to just place a little context around this uh, for all of us to be thinking kind of in the same direction. Um, since the recession hit in late 2008, uh, early 2009, We've all been reading many, many stories in hard print and online uh, regarding the challenges not-for-profit arts organizations are facing, as well as reading multiple stories of closures of theaters, uh, symphonies, museums, uh, or near closures of these organizations, uh, some only to be kept open through extraordinary uh, fundraising initiatives and perhaps really only saved until the next physical crisis or natural disaster. Uh, uh, fires and floods, et cetera. But the question of stability really didn't start, obviously, in 2008. Uh, this is something that we've been dealing with in our sector uh, for decades. Uh, I'm not quite old enough to have participated in uh, the 1960s Ford Foundation uh, program to stabilize the uh, orchestra field, where they invested $60 million uh, to build some capacity among our orchestras. Uh, but I was there for the 1980s when Ford was joined by Mellon and uh, the Rockefeller Foundations to establish the Nar National Arts Stabilization Fund, which was really geared to achieving financial stability in select dance, theater, symphonies, and operas, as well as museums and arts training organizations. Uh, this is when I had the opportunity to meet Marsha Thompson and Len Vignola and start thinking about balance sheets rather than P&Ls and worrying about how to buy pencils and papers for my theater and, and actually beginning to think about the future. Uh, and then also in the early 1990s, uh, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund launched a $25 billion marketing project with 42 select not-for-profit theaters across the country to expand and diversify their audiences. So, over these decades, we've seen a variety of strategies introduced to create a sustainable, not-for-profit performing arts industry. We've gone from the ballot sheet to butts in the seats. And today, we are still asking the essential question, are the cultural arts sustainable? What might it take to answer yes? This investigation is still going on today uh, with a recently launched initiative at the Hauser Center at Harvard University where they have launched a three-year initiative for sustainable arts in America to help strengthen the nation's arts infrastructure and develop a fact-based assessment of the sustainability of urban arts institutions across the country. 
So we know that this work is continuing, and we know that there are questions being asked at a very high level. Uh, I would now like to take the oppor opportunity, question number one, I would now like to take the opportunity to introduce our uh, very, very knowledgeable and talented panelists. Uh, Carol Joins is joining us. He is the co-founder and director of the Cultural Policy Center at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. In addition to establishing the CPC in 1999 and overseeing its development, he has served on a majority of its research projects, helping to produce a comprehensive map of minority participation in Chicago cultural institutions and contributing to entering cultural communities, diversity and change in the nonprofit arts. Carol's research interests include philanthropy, nonprofit, nonprofit governance issues, sustainability in the cultural sector, which is why he's here today, he's an expert, and the arts relationship to economic development. Recently with uh, Norman Bradburn, he co is the co-principal investigator of Set in Stone, a large-scale study of cultural building in the United States. We're very, very pleased to have Carol with us. Uh, and in his volunteer life, Carol serves on the boards of many organizations, uh, including the Newberry Library here in Chicago, WTTW. He is a past chairman of the board of Chicago Opera Theater and of the Alliance Francaise. Uh, welcome, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Ben Cameron, uh, our other panelist, uh, I've known Ben for 30 years, and I said to him as we were getting ready today that I've been listening to him speak for 30 years, and I'm anxious to hear him speak today, as I'm sure many of you are. Uh, ben is currently the Program Director for the Arts at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation in New York City. He's been there since, ninth, uh, since 2006, supervising $13.125 million in grants, focusing on organizations and artists in theater, contemporary dance, jazz, and the presenting field. Prior to his work at the Doris Duke Charitable Fund Foundation, uh, Ben served as the executive director of Theater Communications Group, the national uh, service organization of the American Nonprofit Professional Theater. Uh, before coming to TCG, Ben was at the Dayton Hudson Foundation, now Target Corporation, and then the Target Store's uh, corporate headquarters as manager of community relations, where he supervised a $51 million national giving program. Ben knows about the arts. He's served as keynote speakers for symposia and conferences across the country. And in addition to his not-for-profit work, Ben has had the opportunity and pleasure, which I would like to find out how he got and I would like to get it, of lecturing on the Q, uh, Queen Mary II and Queen Victoria. Uh, ben, welcome to uh, Campbell & Company's uh, webinar on sustainability in the arts. Thank you for having me. As we begin, I'd like Carol first and then uh, Ben to talk a little bit about their personal philosophy and concepts of sustainability uh, that they have developed over their years of work in the nonprofit sector. Carol, would you like to start? <clears throat> Certainly. Thank you. Um, I think one of the problems that comes with um, looking at a topic like sustainability in a field as varied as ours is and a field that is becoming more and more varied by the, by the month, um, is that it depends on what kinds of organizations you're talking about for sustainability. If you're talking about sustaining the cluster of, say, 150 theaters in Chicago that are seen as a kind of ecological niche, they assemble and um, then dissolve on a fairly regular basis. The staff moves to other theaters, other positions, um, but, the, the, but the group stays quite stable. Or are you talking about a single theater and sustaining a, a single theater company? Are you talking about huge organizations like the CSO, the Lyric, the Art Institute, which have um, endowments in the tens or hundreds of millions, or of some very significant small non-collecting museum like the Renaissance Society, which has had enormous influence but has been um, always encumbered by not being able to raise any endowment. Those are very, very different things to look at um, when you're thinking about um, using a term like sustainability. It is literally the ability to sustain an organization and its facility. This involves a team, both staff and board, that has intelligence, um, good judgment, and now particularly risk management skills, um, 
that have a very clear idea of what their mission is and have bonded with that idea of the mission. And it is astonishing to me on some boards that I statement of the organization. I know that for a fact. <laughs> it's happened. Um, knowing that an audience for what you do actually exists, not potentially that hope is not a business plan is I think a very important one, especially in the last four or five years. Um, an ability to deliver on that mission that you have stated. Um, an aptitude for dealing with change. Um, and finally, capital sufficient to operate your organization, which means stable revenue sources, ancillary income, um, making sure, and this is of particular interest to me that in the study that we've done of um, looking at the over 800 um, institutions that built new facilities in the last 16 years, not having your organization be dependent on the facility that you um, inhabit, especially if you are a performing arts center in a performing arts center and you are not the sole owner. The the uh, financial sustainability of a building is different than, have, uh, sometimes highly related to, but different than the sustainability of an organization itself. So that would be my um, notion of sustainability. Thanks, Carol. Ben, would you like to add your thoughts uh, on this topic? Sure. Uh, Robert, I, I know when you asked me to be part of this, I said it's ironic because sustainability and even more stability are terms that we do not particularly use here at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and indeed that I, I try to avoid. I, I will say as a preface and as a reminder, even though you said it, we, because of Doris Duke's will, focus specifically only on organizations and artists in jazz, contemporary dance, and theater. If I worked in the museum field, which of course is charged with the preservation of artifacts and objects in perpetuity, the issue of sustainability and stability would resonate with us in a very different way. But working as I do with choreographer-based dance companies, for example, many of which are founder-based, I think there's a conversation in the arts ecology at large that we've never had about why we place such a value on sustainability and indeed whether we shouldn't say what, why we should default to the position that a, a founded arts organization should continue. Indeed, might we say it's more appropriate that we celebrate how lucky we were to see the, the work of that founding choreographer, but when that choreographer is done, so is the organization. Recognizing the power of locution uh, and the word choices we make, my own personal worry is that in a time of massive change in the external world as well as in the arts, a moment that in other contexts I've likened to the equivalent of the religious reformation with us being in the arts reformation. I've seen so many groups slam the door on potentially breakthrough ideas because of fears that they weren't, that these projects were not sustainable. In our priority system right now, rather than focusing on sustainability and those issues, and, and in fact, giving Merce Cunningham and his dance company more than a million dollars to go out of business as they did a year or so ago and to sunset that organization forever. We're and I think just even that framework, if you, if you focus on how do we promote resilience, how do we promote adaptability, how do we build our capacity to bounce back from the unforeseen or from failure. I think that lens opens a different kind of creative thinking and a new kind of practice that words like sustainability and stability can often inadvertently preclude. Ben, as a follow-up to that, if, if I could, um, you, you mentioned the living choreographers and, and the uh, uh, joy of, of having the experience of seeing these people's work. Um, is there any comment you'd like to make about, uh, you know, looking back at the Martha Graham uh, uh, case study uh, when when Miss Graham died and 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 there was such uh, turmoil around keeping that company alive and and bringing it back and uh, the the loss of that work to future generations. You know, I think what's interesting, I mean, without talking about the Graham, because I, I don't know the case well enough to, to really comment authoritatively on it since it, it preceded my arrival here, and 
that happened when I was in the theater field. I think what was interesting about the Merce Cunningham example recently was Merce made the deliberate decision to go out of business when he passed away. You know, he said, if there's no Merce Cunningham, there doesn't need to be a Merce Cunningham dance company. At the same time, they created a plan that created career transition for the staff and the board. They did a last world tour so that people could see the work one last time. They taught dancers to set the work on other companies, and they set up a licensing division that would license the rights and then funnel those resources back into the dance community at large. So the real salient difference for me is the, the work did not die. They found a way to make the work continue. That was not the same thing as saying that the organization itself needed to continue. And for me, and I'm, this is speaking personally, when we talk about arts institutions, the moment of institutionalization for me is not about resources, it's not about size, it's not about history. The moment of institutionalization for me in arts is when the organization makes a deliberate decision to continue past the founding artistic energy. Because at that point in time, we've all gathered around you because we believe in your work. When you stop as the artist or when your ensemble stops and we continue to go on, we are making that decision for reasons other than that we continue to work with you. The critical questions to be examined at that moment are, I think, what is the value of this organization for this community and what mandates us to continue to move forward rather than what I think I've seen in the arts community at large, which is a default position of, oh, well, the leaders are leaving. We, have, we, we need to hire somebody new. Maybe we don't. And, and you said you wanted a provocative conversation, so maybe these ideas will provoke some heated rejoinders. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, I, I'd like to pose the question, uh, Carol, to you first. Uh, with, with all of uh, what's happening in the media world today, uh, with uh, the online YouTube videos that go viral immediately and you know millions and millions of hits, uh, movies made for the web, live short plays that are streamed, online streaming of music, uh, if, do we include all of this in what we call the arts and cultural landscape? And, and if so, what, if any, does that have when we talk about uh, sustaining uh, bricks and mortar organizations that produce or present art? Um, I think the answer, Robert, is, is that whether we want to or not, um, include it. it it's um, intruding in a more and more forceful way, um, especially for bricks and mortar institutions who are trying to produce and present art um, and maybe have extremely high overhead. Um, our study, for instance, found that the Art Institute of Chicago, which built a magnificent new Renzo Piano building, seriously misestimated the operating costs of that new building. Um, which caused a, a, a series of ricocheting changes inside the organization, at least for the time being, while they get their um, their financial um, house in order again. Um, it, so it's going to the, the fact of these alternative ways of accessing and consuming culture force change on the institutions the same way that they force movie theaters to close in great numbers because people are now watching movies on any number of different kinds of devices in the privacy of their own home exactly when they feel like doing it and when they don't feel like being with other people. Uh, Richard Evans' work uh, in EMC Arts talks about a much more participatory and involved form of activity in pop-up facilities which don't really need an endowment or need sustaining in the same way that a, a large two or three hundred million dollar um, performing arts center or museum does. So it ends up um, being in the end about how people decide each day to spend their time and resources on arts and culture activities. If you go to a museum, a theater, or a musical performance, and one night it's a for-profit concert in a, um, in a stadium, and the next night it's a nonprofit theater, and the night after that it's the Field Museum doing Pearl Jam on their exhibit of pearls with two new bands and um, trying to raise money and get a new audience. Um, it, so it's it's a steadily expanding menu of possibilities with increasingly sophisticated options available. And we're seeing this um, every six months, things seem to be um, transforming. The second thing I would say is that this means that we need to understand taste and preference much better than we do now. And there are some very interesting economists working on this subject. Um, 
they're starting some interesting projects on this. So, in other words, how do people literally, how do they go about selecting what to view, what to listen to, what to participate in? And the most successful organizations will know this um, in relationship to their activity and their potential future, future audiences. They will have a sense, some kind of sense of what the taste and preference of their audience is, but it's a very uncertain science to be sure, and the work in this area is just beginning. And the other, the final thing I would mention is that there, uh, in all of the 580 interviews we've done so far, all of which are transcribed and coded from arts organizations across the country, um, one thing that we see a major contrast in is the difference between young, it's not surprising at all, but it, the times have changed so quickly that the people that were extremely confident in their positions and building an institution up four or five years ago over a period of 20 years hand over the organization to a person who is, who is managing it in an entirely different fashion totally new ideas and many times causing a quite a bit of distress in the person who left. I mean, this is not a new <laughs> phenomenon, but it is as though somehow they are being impugned or rejected for what they've done, which isn't at all the case. It's that somebody is in tune at the age of 33 or 34 or 38 with audiences and desires and preferences and tastes in a way that that person of the prior generation simply cannot be. Yeah, I'd like to throw something out here, uh, a, a follow-up to Carol's comments. Um, th this idea of, of knowledge of the market in terms of taste and preference. Uh, a lot of our nonprofit arts organizations, uh, including museums, uh, are really mission and vision driven. And so, you know, there could be the classic stage company whose mission is to revive the classics. Uh, there could be a Shakespeare company doing Shakespeare. There could be uh, someone doing uh, uh, contemporary symphonic music, uh, and this is their mission. Uh, ben, what um, impact does mission have on the concept of ongoingness? Of uh, to your point about a choreographer who you know we might let expire uh, when he or she expires. Um, yeah, I, what I'm about to say may be considered heretical in some quarters. You know, I, I think that one of the things right now, if if groups are serious about laying claim to a longer term relationship with their audience, you know, which we have, will be self determined whether that's another five years or another fifty years, um, my sense is that mission inappropriately, a, a lot of the notions of mission drift and mission adherence. Uh, can ossify an organization's point of view, and frankly, right now, I'm, I'm more interested in the proposition of uh, uh, what's the value proposition uh, and value delivery that an organization offers its community rather than what its mission is. You know, for, for me, the most interesting arts organizations in general have, uh, if you take the, the classic word mission statement or mission statement um, uh, orientation, there's a generation of arts organizations of which I grew up, with which I grew up, and, and Robert, you just referenced, whose missions are to produce a Shakespeare play. I'm not confident that that centrality of a mission that is focused on what we do is necessarily going to be adequate to weather the rough road ahead. I think there's an enormous difference in a mission between to produce great plays and another mission statement, which is to connect audiences to great plays. And if your mission is to connect audiences to Shakespeare as opposed to produce Shakespeare, it will change every hiring decision you make, every budget allocation, every departmental structure, how you think, what you produce, where you cut corners, et cetera. And especially in a time, you know, for, for good or ill, um, our nonprofit theater movement, for example, was founded in a time primarily based on a conscious notion of decentralizing the arts because the arts were scarce and not available. And, and part of the, the founding premise under McNeil Lowry and the Ford Foundation was you should be able to look at the work of the artist no matter where you live. Well, as you've already referenced, we now have YouTube and we have iPads and we have DVDs and we, have, we are drowning in exposure to arts. And unless we rethink our role in the external environment, I question whether to produce plays is enough of a hold on a community's attention and the proper orientation to, to think that way. So. For me, if you want to adhere to mission rather than value delivery, I still think that thoughtful organizations will work with mission statements that place the audience at the center of the mission 
rather than as an afterthought. There was a children's theater that was one of the most inspiring to me, which stopped saying, our mission is to produce place for children and started to say, our mission is to bring joy into children's lives. And the second they made that switch in their mission and their orientation, it transformed the relationship with the community and the community's responsiveness to helping it. Yeah, it focuses them on a different path. Uh, Carol, you had a follow-up? Um, just a, a, a quick remark that it's, it, it, it speaks, I think, um, Ben, to the, to the issue of organizations that have decided come hell or high water what they are going to deliver because it's good and it's good for you and you should like it even if you don't understand it or know I mean understand it all or uh, know a lot about it that it is a good thing as opposed to what you said is is something where you are actually making connecting with your audience and understanding what that is in a sustained way to, to, to be able to do that and what, the, what you need to bring to the table in order to be able to do that, that's a very, very different kind of activity. So I, I mean, I think I, just, I totally agree. And just as the final, if you read the Mac Lowry early papers in the Ford Foundation, which are so inspiring still, I mean, the one thing that he reminds us is the nonprofit movement, he said, was founded for audiences, yes, and for artists to give them more employment opportunities, yes, and for the art form because we could make more experiments outside the glare of, of uh, the commercial marketplace and the media in New York. And I think we've had the luxury, certainly in my time, in a time of, of, of more ample funding to focus really primarily on the nonprofits and their service to artists. And I think we're beginning now to realize that the nonprofits claim is that trifecta in terms of audience and artist and art form, and that we're probably disserving ourselves if we focus exclusively on any one of those to the detriment and the neglect of the other two. Yeah, I think there was an interesting uh, phenomenon back in the, I think it was the 80s, uh, where, you know, TCG actually, Theater Communications Group, actually produced this book called The Artistic Home. And, you know, there was a real in, introspective, internal uh, focus to that concept of the artistic home. And, and Ben, I would wonder if it didn't, uh, you know, sort of obviate the, the, uh, post, the postulation you just put forward about the external, uh, uh, you know, in fundraising, we call it donor-centric, and in marketing and in promoting the arts, uh, you know, you're really calling it audience-centric. Well, you know, I think The Artistic Home, which is a great report and still valuable and written by Todd London, really was written in the late 80s at a time in which there was the perception that organizations and artists were fracturing and that the organizations were losing the voice and the conscience of the artist as a central driver within the organization. So I think it responded to a particular condition and a particular moment in time. That said, my own worry, observing other fields and, and in any other field, one of the earmarks they will tell you about a dying industry is that a dying industry looks inward rather than outward. And that for all of our great discussions in many fields, not just the the theater field, but the orchestra field and the dance field. And what, if our primary attention in this rapidly changing environment is internally focused about our relationships with one another and not externally focused about the larger environment in which we serve and the, the constituents we have outside the organization, then I really worry about our ability to make the kinds of change and the adaptations that will ensure our continuing viability. Uh, we put a poll up a few minutes ago uh, regarding, uh, uh, on a scale of one to five, with five being very and one being not at all, how stable do you uh, feel that your organization is? Uh, just to report out on that poll, 21% uh, said very stable uh, of the respondents and 7% uh, not at all. Uh, and, and, you know, we see falling in the middle uh, although not quite the middle, 17% uh, rated their institution as the number two, which uh, might suggest that they're moving very close to instability, and 14% in the middle, uh, with 21% being very and 41% rated as a four. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, kind of take on the uh, audience that's listening to us today. I'd like to go to another slide here, and following up a little bit on Ben's comment about uh, uh, well, let me not even put it in that context. Rafa Landsman, the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, said in a public forum uh, recently uh, this concept of supply and demand, and, and that the demand is not increasing, uh, so we need to start thinking about decreasing the supply. 
uh, he went so far as to say that there might be too many regional theaters. It's possible. Um, uh, Carol, what's your take on this position of the National Endowment for the Arts? Um, I, I think it, it sounded heretical when he said that, and I remember being at a presenting at a meeting of uh, grants makers in the arts a few years ago when there was a bit of a dust storm when people were talking about the possibility of figuring out how to help organizations close down in an orderly way. And it made me wonder at the time, and I still wonder about this, why we, why we treat arts organizations differently than other kinds of institutions where people may be distressed that a hospital is closing or a school is closing, but there's usually a reason why they are. And we know that the gap will be filled in some manner, and we don't go to pieces. But something about um, an arts organization may, makes people think of harp seals of baby harp seals or something, and they just simply cannot um, cannot stand the idea that it will go uh, out of business. And I think it is the the issue is now being forced on many organizations in a way that it, it with a brutality it hasn't in the past because of the downturn. But it but it in a sense it's not just about the economic downturn and a diminishment in resources. It's about like a, 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 a water level in a in a pond going down, you see the 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 things that are hiding on the bottom that were there to begin with, and they are um, they are uh, indications of distress or difficulty, and it simply exaggerates them more. And maybe it is time to close down in an orderly fashion because no one. I mean, we we go back and forth on this issue in the sector. No one is able to give uh, a persuasive answer about demand, existence of demand in the arts, and how you respond to what you hope is the demand versus what the actual demand may actually be for the product. So in a city like Chicago, we have over 150 not-for-profit theaters, um, companies, uh, not uh, buildings, but 150 theater companies. Uh, it may not be more than that, Robert, you would probably know, but it's a lot. But, but a set number come apart and disassemble each each year and and people move to other other organizations and that seems like a healthy a, a healthy thing to me not a sad thing so Ben anything to add there um, you know I, I think Rocco's statement and I think Rocco's done a great job at the NEA but I think the statement's really fraught with problems in a lot of ways and and I think as you've already alluded to we we don't it would be ludicrous if somebody made the same statement about either restaurants or dot-com startups and said there are too many we have to start closing them down and, and the question starts saying okay so who's making the decision about which ones go who decides which and, and it's just fraught with problems and for me it's not a particularly helpful point of view the, the the other thing I would say is we reach as we know a fraction of the American population population. If I thought we couldn't increase demand, then I'd just fold my tent up and go away tomorrow. I mean, I think all of us in the arts live in the hopes and in the conviction that we that demand is increasable. We have not maxed out on our communities by any way. How we are willing to adapt and pursue that, that's a whole different conversation. But I think internally we we have to believe that that it is possible to to increase demand. And frankly, if anything, um, I, I think one of the things that's the most hopeful indicators about this, by and large, frankly, is the record number of young people that are choosing arts majors and want to go into the arts for their lives. And virtually every study which shows that even though attendance may be going down, arts participation, people writing their own poetry or singing their own songs or singing in choirs and writing their own plays and making their own movies especially, is exploding at an exponential rate. How we connect what we have historically done as a producing entity with a new kind of explosive demand that is being manifest in the arts, that, that's a whole terrain of, I think, a really interesting discussion. But I don't accept the premise that demand is not increasable, and I certainly reject any discussion that somebody's going to make the decisions of which theaters go and which theaters stay. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you, Ben, except that the marketplace and donors, exhausted donors in some cases, um, donors with um, increasingly empty pockets are making that decision. It isn't, it isn't um, an authority of, of any centralized uh, character, but the yes, marketplace but Robert, that, is that, making that decision. But that, even that description presumes that the circle of donors is finite. I mean, if you take the, the premise, I, I think it is a fair statement to say 
the amount of, of the, the number of nonprofit organizations that can be reasonably supported and sustained, to use your word, by the current philanthropic sector is out of balance. The solution is either then you, then you make fewer arts organizations or you increase the philanthropic landscape. I mean, that's just a different discussion. I don't presume that the current donors is, is the limited donor set that we have for the future. And, you know, I mean, these things go in cycles, as we know. You know, if you had looked in 1950 at donor circles for the arts in the United States, it would have been negligible. In the 1980s, it was enormous beyond our imaginings. Now we're pressed again, but that to me doesn't necessarily mean that it's not increasable again. What about the cost of producing uh, this work? Uh, you know, whether it's the uh, mega millions that were spent uh, for the new wing at the Art Institute, or uh, I think it's uh, $300 million for the Kauffman Center in, in $400 million for the Kauffman Center in, in Kansas City. Uh, you know, you go to a regional theater across America, tickets are 25 to $86. Um, museums, uh, between 12 and $29 for entry to a museum. What, what can we do? What do leaders need to be thinking about in terms, or do they need to be thinking about, or, and if so, how, uh, thinking about cost uh, containment in a way to make this art more available on the admission side? Ben? Sorry, I was on mute. I started to talk and my mute button was on. Um, I'd say two things. One is, um, or three things. One is we don't do capital and we don't do buildings here. And quite frankly, I'm deeply grateful that we don't. Uh, at this moment in time, I, I think there's a real conversation to be had about, have, in terms of oversupply, are we overbuilding physically a sector right now at particularly a moment of massive change? I've said to people, I'm glad we don't fund buildings because, frankly, I'm not smart enough to know if the ideal theater or the ideal dance concert hall at this moment in time is going to be a 2,000-seat auditorium with massive screens or if it's going to be a 20-seat studio with TV feeds into 40 different channels. I, I don't know that. And if I don't know that, why am I choosing to ossify an audience performer relationship in bricks and mortar at this point in time when so much is in play? And why am I going increasingly building heavy at a time the rest of the world is going increasingly virtual? I mean, there, there's, a, there's a peril here. And one of the things I think we're seeing in a lot of communities is, unfortunately, the creation of massive new buildings rarely carries with it the operating funds needed to sustain them. And inadvertently, some of these places become drags on the because of fear of letting them not meet their financial obligations. That's a whole other discussion about buildings. Clearly, I think for audiences to contain costs, I would just say two things in general. One is um, it's a moment like in everything else about the question isn't sometimes what are you going to start doing next, and the questions are what are you going to stop doing to free up the resources and the energy and the time to do what what you would normally do. I mean, there are a lot of questions to be asked now, especially in a virtual age, about whether our newspaper advertising budgets justify their cost, whether the printing of programs at a time when people can virtually download them and read them on PDAs, or whether that's worth the cost. I mean, there, every line, I think, is worth examining for the necessity versus the sentimental practice. The other thing that I, I, I actually was inspired by, and this is the National Theater story, which if you've heard them tell about a national theater, is they said basically, look, you know, the bottom line is we wanted to, we were worried about the increasing inaccessibility of the National Theater. And so we began to do a survey, and they, they said we measured our number, we measured our own data, and I may get the percentages wrong, but they said what is the income on earned income going to be at our current scale if we play to 65 or 66 percent of the house, which is roughly what they were doing, versus what would our income be if we played to 95 percent of the house but at 10 pounds a ticket? And they said right. we ran the numbers and the gap wasn't as big as we all thought it was going to be. And frankly, the yeah. earned revenue in many organizations is more nominal than we'd like to admit. They went to a corporation then and they said basically we're just asking you to plug the hole plug the hole between that 66% data figure and the 95% data figure, and that's what's led to the 10-pound ticket, which has transformed the organization, revitalized the organization. That audience is young. That audience is diverse. The place is packed every night. 
we talk a lot about endowing buildings. We talk a lot about endowing artists. If we're going to endow anything, what happens if we begin to think about endowing the audience and raising the massive funds that ensure that access is kept at a more nominal level? It's a kind of campaign that you hear occasionally discussed behind closed doors, but to the best of my knowledge, nobody is seriously taken to heart as yet. Well, yeah, th this concept of endowing the audience is, is, is really interesting. And uh, we did that at the Baltimore Symphony uh, a number of years ago when uh, Marin Alsop uh, became the new conductor there. Um, she did not want to play to halls that were half empty. And so it was the 25th anniversary of being in, in the uh, uh, performance. And so uh, the subscription brochure was being printed. It was at the printer. Uh, we pulled that brochure, and the marketing director there and, and others of us uh, who were involved uh, put everything in a $25 ticket. So if you were sitting in the best seat in the house that used to cost you $135, you now got that ticket for $25 in celebration of the 25th anniversary of being in the hall. And uh, we didn't know what was going to happen, uh, whether anybody would show up, and, and we tried to pitch it to the media and people weren't interested. On the Saturday morning that these tickets went on sale, there were lines wrapped twice around the building. All the camera crews from the local stations were there filming it. And it really did begin uh, you know, a, a kind of transformation of thinking and of access uh, and availability. Certainly not endowing the orchestra because uh, the audience because that program didn't go forward. Uh, Carol had some things that he wanted to say. I think about the endowment of the audience. Um, well, I, I think it's a wonderful phrase then uh, to endow the audience. We actually asked uh, the, the, the we being um, um, a, a different we than the the research staff. Uh, we asked Jim Cuno before he left the Art Institute for the Getty be free and open to the public at all times. And it's very inspirational if you go to somewhere like the British Museum and you see every possible age group, every possible ethnic group flowing in and out of that building, get their money's worth out of it. They're going to be able to go see whatever they want to see when they want to see it. But the difficulty, of course, is if, the, if that figure is 150 or 200 million, that when the endowment suddenly drops through the floor and the organization is struggling and that money is sequestered and suddenly it just becomes part of the endowment and it becomes part of the emergency funds to keep the organization alive and so the actual setting up of this kind of thing is is, is very difficult. Our conclusion from the study from Set in Stone given all that we looked at, um, Duncan Webb is one of the people that advised us who has worked on 185 projects um, to conclude to their conclusions of building projects. Um, he said if he could, he would stop every new building project um, for the next uh, of a performing arts center for the next um, uh, 25 years, if at all possible, because he said we are seriously overbuilt from his point of view. But that's anyway. That's a longer discussion. Well, uh, there are a lot to, of lo to, longer discussions. Go ahead, Ben. I'm sorry. I, I was just saying to add the coattails on that. I've always said if I were running a, a performing arts organization, now I wouldn't want a building. I'd want the Cirque du Soleil tent. I would want something that was mobile, that I could move from community to community, that brought me an intimate encounter in a high-tech setting uh, from, uh, from artist to audience, and that was flexible and permeable. And, and that's a very different proposition than building a performing arts center downtown with multiple stories, escalators, and permanent facilities. And, and and a huge um, a huge overhead to just keep it keep its doors open. I think that's exactly the kind of thinking that is going to have to take place. And it isn't because we're poor. It's because we need to be, as you said, much more nimble and. Um, uh, uh, you do not do capital uh, at the Doris Duke. Uh, uh, charitable foundation. Uh, you certainly have experience with endowments, and I. I of, of exploration. Uh, you know, as I alluded to uh, in, in my days of running theaters, the National Arts Stabilization Fund really uh, stressed looking at balance sheet, looking at liquidity, uh, looking at positive net current position of assets. And that was at a time when a lot of us who were running theaters were really uh, just worried about supplies and artist salaries and clothes to put on actors and whatnot. Um, 
then, then everybody did get on the endowment bandwagon, those that could. And uh, in 2008, 2009, you know, we even saw Harvard cutting back on expansion plans and, and, and new departments and whatnot because of their endowment uh, decreasing uh, in this severe recession. Uh, what about endowment today? Is it the silver bullet that we thought it was, Ben? Uh, you know, when we, we uh, at the Duke Foundation decided consciously to stop doing endowments, and part of the reason we began to, to think about that was, again, the issue that in our fields, and again, contemporary dance, jazz, and theater, we were less than comfortable with the notion that uh, the value of an organization was premised or should be connected to an idea about perpetuity. Again, if I were a museum, it would be an entirely different set of issues that I'd be bringing into play, but for the performing arts at least, uh, the issue of perpetuity is questionable. We actually yeah, commissioned gonna, Russell with... Let yeah. me interrupt you for just a quick second. Uh, yeah. wh what, what do you say to the staffs and boards of those major uh, regional theaters and dance companies that populate our uh, uh, biggest uh, uh, cities and um, the city founding fathers and current leaders say, you know, for us to be a world-class city, we have to have dance, opera, theater, and ballet. Uh, and those are institutions that have endowments and have big staffs. What do you say to them when, when they're struggling and, and yet you say we don't need to think about perpetuity? Well, I th I'd say two things. One is, uh, or probably three things. Uh, one is that, uh, and you can find some of this on our website at, at Duke because Russell Willis Taylor, who's now the head of National Arts Strategies, which used to be National Arts Stabilization, and I think that, that change in their title is revealing, uh, we commissioned a paper for her called The Grasshopper and the Ant, which is question, which, which we said deliberately, is there a downside to endowment for performing arts organizations and could you explore that? I would say to those people, number one, please do not interpret that I am saying that you should not raise significant, massive, if at all possible, resources that will see you through a rainy day. I think absolutely any smart thinking organization will build significant reserves and significant uh, resources to help it in bad times. But to permanently restrict that in a way that when you have a strategic opportunity, especially in a rapidly changing world, and it, rather than being able to lay your hands on a significant amount of capital, you're restricted to 5% of a draw often means that you will miss some of the most strategic opportunities possible and you'll miss some of the opportunities that could have promoted your longer term strategic health. So d don't interpret, I, I'm not a fan of endowments as I'm not a fan of significant resources because those statements are, are, are different statements. The second thing I would say, and this is really harder to say, is I think there, there is a confusion between the presence of an art form and the viability of a particular organization. You know, I, I, a lot of times right now, I've just started, personally started questioning. You know, when people say, uh, but people don't love the arts or people don't value the arts, I've recently started saying, how would we think differently if we said, no, people do value the arts. They value them very deeply. You know, they look at the, the consumption patterns on radio and on the internet and the use of music and how you see everybody walking down the street now listening to their iPads and iPods and people are more connected to the art than any time in history. They're just not in love with our delivery mechanism of it. And if that's, that's the question, if well, that's the question, that, then maybe the issue isn't about the ballet company, it's about the presence of ballet. And if we started to think about how to make sure that ballet, ballet would flourish in the community rather than the organization as we've known it in the concert format has to continue to go on, again, that's just two different discussions. Oh. Uh, Carol, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ben's uh, talk about endowment and, and wanting to have significant funds on hand. Uh, ben, I'm interpreting that to mean you know, a cash reserve or uh, a board designated fund for artistic uh, initiatives. Carol, how do we convince our boards that you know, perhaps a you know, $100 million endowment campaign is not really what we should be doing? We should be building some of these other kind of less restrictive uh, financial tools. Well, again, it, it depends on the kind of institution. As as um, has been pointed out, it's very different if you're a museum and your mandate is to preserve um, collections and to instruct the public about the meaning of those collections as opposed to a performing arts um, organization. So they're very different animals and the needs are very different. You can't afford to be much more nimble in the latter than in the former. Um, I think that um, 
to just to follow on what Ben was saying a moment ago, that uh, to follow up on that, I think that helping a board or at least the executive committee of a board um, to to think seriously about risk taking, about risk taking and risk management, um, and helping them see that maybe cantilevering themselves out a little bit to try some new things to be able to invest in new ways of doing what they do to try to um, engender the kind of audience that Ben was, was, believes exists, as I do, and that is currently not coming, is worth that risk. But I, I think, in general, boards are, are trained to think about preservation, are trained to read cash flow statements. Well, some of them are um, trained to do that, some are not. Um, but they are used to seeing these, but there's a, um, but the mindset is one of, of conserve and maybe even hoard and not being willing to risk um, at a given moment an investment in something that really might push the whole organization forward but would involve some risk. Yeah, uh, we took two polling questions. Uh, one was regarding cash reserves and uh, what percentage of uh, our listeners have those. 36% uh, uh, do not have a cash reserve. 27% uh, one for three months, 23% for six months, and 14% uh, for 12 or more months of a cash reserve. We also asked a question about endowment and the preponderance, almost 50% uh, uh, of listeners' endowments are under <laughs> 1 million, 27% between a million and five, this is the sweet spot, and 13% uh, uh, between five and 20 million, and 13% between, 13% uh, over $20 million. So some large endowments here, uh, but preponderance seem right around that million dollar level. Uh, ben and Carol, I want to ask you, what kind of talent, what kind of strategy, strategic thinking, what kind of leaders do we need for today and tomorrow to make sure that we have these arts organizations alive and vital and vibrant like we all vision them to be? Uh, Carol, would you mind starting with that? Well, I, I, would, I would, in the end, I would agree with Ben that you really do need this, you need it, arts leaders, or leaders of arts organizations that are nimble, flexible, that help their organizations be resilient and respond to a, this landscape that's changing so quickly. Um, and I, I think you can take some lessons from, um, developments, um, one as recently as an article in the Washington Post that appeared on the 8th of November, which is very recent. Um, this is an article about um, the, the recording company Naxos, which almost went under, but has basically found uh, a whole series of ways to reinvent itself and become, it's actually quite a complicated but a very interesting story about, about literally a company that's, who, whose leader had all these characteristics, but they stepped back and they said, what we have here at Naxos is a very serious artistic mission from our standpoint, um, and we need to be able to survive, and how are we going to do that? And I, I think once or many organizations reach a certain size and have a board and have set board meetings and so forth, that kind of nimbleness, that kind of ability to think outside the box is, is relatively rare. But there are some very, very good models for that. I would strongly recommend that people take a look at the story, um, uh, Google it and see. It's on it's, um, the Washington Post on November 8th on, on the um, recording company, Noxos. Yeah, I, I think, Ben, uh, you know, this idea of nimbleness and resilience is, is really an important concept for our listeners to, to think about. Um, you know, as, as we leave uh, our webinar here in the next few minutes, uh, th this may be unfair, but uh, uh, Ben and Carol, I'd like you each, uh, if you would indulge me, uh, to give your top five key criteria or key benchmarks uh, to uh, ensure that their organizations are pursuing the best practices towards sustainability. Um, ben, would you mind going first on that? The five key elements that they need to be on top of 
to make sure they are continuing to move towards sustainability. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. And, and actually, can I cheat the answer slightly by just adding on to the previous question for a minute about leadership, because I think it's such an important question. To, to yeah. what Carol said, I would just think for the future, a leader, in addition to everything you mentioned, has to have uh, intercultural fluency an embrace of diverse cultures, I think a technological facility and appreciation for media, uh, I think uh, uh, an appreciation for new models of uh, sharing information and consensual decision making. And I was especially impelled by a woman I heard named Margaret Heffernan who said, organizations don't think because the people inside of them are too afraid of conflict. And that the leader for the future will actually encourage, nurture, and then galvanize divergent points of view rather than insist on a kind of uniformity of perspective and squelching conflict. So that, that's, my, that's my cheat. Uh, so for the uh, uh, five things that I would probably say around the, the standards, when I think about nimble organizations, I actually think of them as having uh, these characteristics, that there's clarity around organizational direction, values, and long-term vision, producing a culture of shared purpose and values, uh, and but consciously evolving. Secondly, that there is some degree of a predictable financial resource that comes from a robust business model and a range of activities and shareholders and significant reserves, which we've said before. Uh, the third is I think that there is an ongoing dedication to professional development and learning and reflective practice and time given to reflective practice. Uh, the fourth thing I think is there's a deep situational awareness of environment and performance with outstanding gathering, sharing, and consideration of intelligence and information that will inform their decisions. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is that there are clear leadership management and governance roles with clear roles and responsibilities and where possible that there's a, a relative absence of silos and cross-departmental collaboration with, uh, as I just alluded to earlier, a significant sharing of information and an embrace of divergent ideas and points of view. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I loved your, and I wish you could say them again, so if you can, you started with intercultural fluency, consensual uh, decision making, encouraging conflict. What were those again? Oh, about the, the leaders, I said, well, there was intercultural fluency, I said techno, tech, technological facility, comfort yeah. and appreciation of media. Uh, I said a, an awareness of and encouragement of uh, new models, especially around how we share information internally and externally, how we uh, reach decisions and who the decision-making bodies are, and uh, how we encourage conflict. And again, I quoted Margaret Heffernan, who at the TED conference in Edinburgh said, Organizations don't think because the people inside of them are too afraid of conflict. And if we really want to promote thinking organizations, we have to find a different kind of way to promote and encourage not conflict. I mean, you don't want all-out warfare, but you want a, a, an environment where divergence of opinion, belief, and perspective is encouraged and considered and channeled rather than squelched out of some sort of insistence on authority or uniformity. I Thank think you. that's what and I said. That is exactly, uh, I just wanted to get it. Uh, Carol, could you uh, uh, share with us in the last two minutes uh, sure. your back. top five? Um, but I, first of all, I want to work at that organization then. I don't know what, where it is, but I like the description of that, if, you, if it's all of those things. Um, uh, the ones that I had that Ben, um, that, that ben didn't already mention is somehow, um, well, you did mention, but just to elaborate for a moment, the, idea of getting the board to fully own the organization because I have been on way too many boards. I have been on way too many boards where there are uh, board members who show up, but there clearly is not a sense of full ownership of the organization and full responsibility for it. Finally, the issue uh, of another issue is accessibility and diversity that somehow you have a market-sensitive cost structure. Um, ben, you mentioned this in another context, and so did, so did you, um, Robert. Um, that you, you, make these, as you make what you have available at a cost that you can actually talk seriously about having a diverse audience, and that you have a demonstrated and felt inclusiveness, um, which <laughs> a lot of organizations still do not, particularly. Um, they say they do, but they act, it, does, it doesn't feel that way to the audiences always that come in. And um, that the education aspect, the outreach and community engagement, really needs to be real. It has to be something real because they're, even the foundations themselves, I think, sometimes cause people in 
not-for-profit organizations to come up with something that fits with the guidelines of the foundation and the demand for outreach and education, and they end up with perfunctory plans that they either, neither have the money nor the energy nor possibly the vision to execute well. And other organizations do a stupendous job at it. But without that, without having a robust, um, having that be a robust part of your mission, I think it puts the organizations at risk. And I have some more, but we're out of time, so. We are out of time. And I want to thank Ben Cameron uh, from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. And Carol joins here in our studio at Campbell and Company uh, uh, from the University of Chicago Pub Public uh, Cultural Policy uh, Group uh, for a really invigorating conversation. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope that you were able to take at least one thing away from this back to your organization to uh, continue the great work that you're all doing. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, who joined us today, and absolutely a special thank you to Carol and Ben. Fantastic. Um, we have an upcoming webinar that you all might be interested in. Uh, join us on Wednesday, January 23rd for Using Analytics to Drive Fundraising Success. Uh, this is complimentary. Uh, and you can register on our website at CampbellCompany.com. And then from all of us at, at Campbell Company, we wish you a wonderful and restful Thanksgiving holiday. So thank you all again. Take care. Bye-bye.